Welcome to another episode of Get Wisdom. I'm Brian Kelly, along with Get Wisdom founder and director Carl Mollison. This week, we're going to explore the wisdom behind common divine, you know, common truths that we consider wisdom. We're going to get Crater's uh, take on these. Crater explains the divine truth in Murphy's Law and other sayings. Yes, well, this is a time-honored one, Murphy's Law. I've grown up with this one, and having worked in research, it was a common parlance in that community, and I don't know how many others, but there's a lot of uh, ironic twists to life, and humor is used to cope. So oh, yes. there's often a kind of witticism that has a mournful <laughs> aspect to it, <laughs> you know, c- kind of... Um, addressing the plight we feel we're a part of and when things go bad and our plans are dashed and our hopes collapse and all of that sarcasm is alive and well (laughs) yeah well it it's a it's a way to to keep going in spite of everything yeah it's a mechanism it helps but but there's we're finding there is a deeper meaning behind some of these and a deeper origin, in fact, of the need to have them in the first place. We're supposed to have a paradise down here. And the fact that we don't is pointing us directly at serious issues. So this is what we bump into all the time because we're looking and we're probing and we're open to exploring it. Most people are complacent. They just take it as it comes and don't think. And it's a, it's a loss because we need to come together. Well, let's get on and explore some of the things that are coming forth. So you ask creator, what is the divine perspective of the saying, if something can go wrong, it will. All right, and this is Creator's words that I channeled. This is human pessimism distilled into its essence with a clever and ironic saying that has a deeper inner truth. Your culture has come to represent failure as much as success. The deep hidden truth here is that the failings of human endeavors are owing to their inner corruption and the manipulation by interlopers in many, many ways and many levels of human society. You are corrupted by dark spirit attachments to a high degree, being that 90% of people have such dark influences corrupting them, interfering with their very thoughts, stirring up dark inner emotions and causing many distractions, perturbations and collusion with the dark spirit attachments in others in the environment to undermine people at every turn. This, coupled with the dark designs of extraterrestrials serving as puppet masters to control the world from behind the scenes, means that you are in the grip of the darkness and it will not allow too much light to enter or be on display. They will find a way to burst any bubble, deflate any ambitious undertakings, and crush your dreams. This is the greatest challenge humanity has ever faced or will face. You are being tested to see how you do. Most people are in failure mode at the moment because they are complacent, having been subjugated and oppressed for so long they're under the thumb of the interlopers and being manipulated in their very minds to not look at or think about the many things wrong in the world. And that complacency will be their downfall if it continues much longer. It is time for humans to wake up and see what is truly needed. They must now work in earnest, come together, and reach out to the divine realm for help. This is a problem bigger than humans can correct. Much can be done through prayer. The rest needs healing requests of a high order and sophistication. You have the tool to request healing in the most meaningful way. That is a timely and essential development that can turn the tide and remove this menace. If you do not do so, it will be your undoing. It need not happen on your watch, but you will be responsible either way. So choose wisely in what you do and do not do here. Well, you know, it's interesting that Creator actually takes this opportunity to, you know, put that warning out there again about what's really behind this this observation that the saying basically conveys. You know, I, I think that Creator probably could have handled this answer differently, but this is, uh, Creator's taking this opportunity to, to really put something in front of us that, that needs our attention. 
Well, and it does. When are people going to wake up? <clears throat> we just have had the second shooting at a Navy base in a week. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, this isn't the world I grew up in as, as a kid, you know, where no. people on military installations would suddenly break out and commit a mass shooting because they got disenchanted with something or had a grievance. And, of course, this is going on all over. There's one every day somewhere. Yes. And on a small scale or large or within a family group or a work setting. And it, it's the big ones that are, you know, kind of the most grievous is school shooting or a church shooting that kind of get the press these days. Because right. it's, it's so humdrum. But this isn't, something... the way, this isn't the way the world's supposed to be. Right. And, and a shooting like that is not something that just goes wrong because of incompetence or because someone was over their oversight or something like that or just bad luck. That's an intentional act. And there's an intent behind it. And that's what the message behind Murphy's Law is here, is that there's somebody doing this to us. Yeah. You, know? you ask creator, what is the divine perspective of the saying, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely? Yeah, this is another one I've heard all my life. And uh, people turn to again and again, because it often proves to be oh so true. And this is what creator says about it. This is a kernel of human wisdom that is hard won, having lived with oppressors of all kinds and being subjugated by many tyrants and faulty governing bodies, often an elitist group choosing to empower themselves at the expense of others and ruling through brute force or a clever propaganda campaign to keep people satisfied with unending promises and keep the game going with low-level rewards only. There are many variations on the theme, but it is a truism that power is non-divine when used to raise the self at the expense of others. The objective in life is to raise the self at no expense to others, and also, and importantly, raise others at no expense to the self. If you think about these twin goals, they cannot be both be achieved if there is not a level playing field and fairness chosen as the ultimate aim for human endeavor to ensure things come out evenly with mutual gain and not favoring one over another. Power implies an imbalance by its very definition. Power that is of a potential nature is not inherently evil. Power is of tremendous advantage if it is used wisely and for the good of all. But all too often, power is used to subvert the plans of others and will backfire on the perpetrator eventually. But in the meantime, many are harmed and there is much suffering that ensues. The ability of power to corrupt is a shorthand description for growth of the ego and satisfying ego-based concerns. This is the seductive nature of power, that it flatters the powerful and their sense of security gained, inflates their sense of self and self-importance. This is a slippery slope that can cause people to begin enjoying the exercise of power and even in many cases, the suffering of others is a demonstration of the power they hold. This is a kind of depravity because of its great departure from the divine path. But this is the nature of the interlopers in your world. The members of the darkness are depraved beings because they are loveless and serve only the self. Those in power have that privilege through brute force alone, through cunning and savagery. That is no way to live. It is a way to die. Their very souls and continued existence are at risk. That is far too high a price to pay for being in power. In the end, nothing is gained if that power ends up destroying you. It is a self-destruction that is arranged by one's own wrongdoing. The light is always here for everyone, and we will extend love to everyone. Those who choose to turn away are using their free will unwisely, and service to the ego and to the self alone will distance themselves from creator's love. That choice will condemn them in the end. There's a lot of powerful lessons in this, for sure. Um, you know, I've always seen the need 
for exercising power over others as a, as a form of deep insecurity. And they're attempting to assuage that insecurity with external you know, markers, external uh, achievements uh, over others as a kind of evidence to try to overcome their own insecurity. Of course, it doesn't work. They just need more and more power, you know, infinitely, yeah. essentially. Well, there's the, there's the lesson, the object lesson in it. It's a false promise because eventually it weakens the person further. It makes them vulnerable to their own wrongdoing, coming back, circling back around to them via the law of karma. And we, we talk about that a lot because that is the driving force of the universe. Yes. And it's the, it's the great leveler. It's the divine kind of enforcement system that runs automatically. It's not God up there judging everyone right and left and sending thunderbolts down to uh, punish and so on. It's actual energy that has an intelligence that goes to work and figures out where love is missing and seeks to put love back. And where you've caused the love to be missing, it will come and take love away from you at some point when you most need it and most enjoy it. And that'll be your comeuppance. And it's not a judgment. It is a self-created problem. Yes. It's, it's actually not a form of punishment, but it's really more of an opportunity to grow. It's, yes. That's, that's a different perspective on that. But that's that's right. It's, it's an opportunity to learn. Yes. Yeah. You ask creator, what is the divine perspective of the saying, use it or lose it? All right. And creator says, this is a fine truism that applies in almost every field of endeavor engaged in by human beings. It applies to the mental, the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual realm equally. Truth is lived and therefore more than an idea. Truth can be described in the abstract, but it becomes truth in the implementation and not through thought alone. That is the difference between thinking and true being. To be means to exist in a tangible way through a demonstration of an interaction with life. What is learned by the mind will fade over time and be forgotten. When information has a value, it is because it translates into something in the real world that has a practical utility and yields a reward. The same is true in exercising spirituality. To be in divine alignment is an active process, not a passive one. If one is in isolation in a controlled environment where there is no flexibility, no options, no power to make anything happen, then one's choices have no consequence, for one cannot go wrong any more than one can learn and grow in new ways to increase the reach and add to possibilities and making the universe more complete. It is the implementation of divine principles when it counts through conducting one's life in a divine fashion. To live and work and be a person in alignment with love and all they do is the highest attainment and the highest state of enlightenment. But love, too, is not an idea alone. It is an expression, a gifting of great value and a kind of energy that uplifts, enriches, and rewards all it touches. People get better at what they do repeatedly. Everything must be learned in the world you inhabit. Learning comes best by doing, so the exercise of divine principle will be met with consequences, favorable or unfavorable. That is how one will tell the success of their choices. That feedback will guide them to do better and avoid mistakes and shortcomings. This is the same in the intellectual arena across the board. People will be judged by their fruits. How they perform will be the criterion through which they also judge themselves. Practice makes perfect. One can always learn more through failure than through success. The iterative process to work through the challenges will bring much learning and growth, and using one's talent and one's desires and good intentions will always bring rewards, even if there is short-term failure, that learning will be a blessing in the end because it will be a springboard for improvement and true achievement. The saying applies to the physical body every bit as much. Those who deal with helping people enhance their physical performance, as in the field of athletics, know full well that the body must be not only utilized, but 
utilized with intensity to build up stamina, strength, endurance, as well as training the muscles and other physical capabilities to reach high-level performance of any physical endeavor. Inactivity is a signal to the body that you are done and no longer need it. The body will respond to this seeming instruction by shutting down and will do so more and more in a conservation mode. The way back is to increase use, to reawaken the urgency and instructions the body is indeed indeed needed again for duty. And over time, one can usually work back into higher functioning capability. So there is a wisdom in using all your capabilities and all of your gifts, and especially those sorely needed and highly prized because they serve the sole purpose the sole purpose for the life you lead, to take nothing for granted and make an investment in honing and sharpening your skills and talents. Growth can be continual. You need not settle for any particular level of limitation or restriction. There is always a way forward to gain more. You know, the... uh the last second from last paragraph about how the body will respond uh, to inactivity by shutting down. <laughs> that's like, whoa. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, it, you, you look at that, you go, yeah, that's true. But, you know, I'm not a spring chicken and, uh, you know, I, I get exercise and that's something I enjoy, but that's a, that's an important message there. I got to take that to heart some more. Well, it, it's an interesting insight that people mostly have never thought about. Yes. The body responds to our will, to our consciousness, and the desires that it puts forth. And you see this with aging, and people just sort of dry up and wither, and it's it's visible, and you know the skin is wrinkled, and the 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 hands and joints are gnarled, and they're stooped over and shrunken. And shuffling and rigid, not flexible and able to move freely and easily. That's a function of a kind of a slow winding down. Yes. And you can counteract it by winding yourself up a bit and making a determination to do things to move the body, use it, make, it make movement to create growth and flexibility and not give in to the decline that will happen. Well, we're on the topic of use it or lose it. We have getwisdom.com. Please check it out. Use it. We don't want anybody losing it. Uh, you can check out our healing services that are on there as well as download our free ebooks. And uh, Carl, tell us a little bit about uh, the healing. Well, we have a comprehensive healing protocol that addresses all manner of difficulties and it cuts across all these arenas, the mental, the emotional, the physical, and the spiritual, because all are important and all need care and feeding. And this protocol works through creator of all that is, and it gets the permission of the higher self to do its work so you can gift it to others, even non-believers, It's done with respect and with their soul's permission. So it's just like doing a high-level prayer. So you can learn more about that. Sorry, Carl. You can learn more about that at getwisdom.com slash LHP. You can download the book on that, and we'll be right back right after this. Welcome back to the second segment of Get Wisdom. We are looking at common sayings and how much divine truth is actually in them. It's a pretty interesting exploration. Carl, you asked creator, what is the divine perspective of the saying, those who can do... Those who cannot teach. All right. And this is what I channeled from Creator in answer to that question. These are Creator's words. There is wisdom in this observation. It can be thought of quite superficially as representing a personal failing of those choosing to be teachers. It is not always the case that teachers lack talent and ability to be part of the working world and competing with others and excelling, potentially, to become leaders in their field and innovators. There are many fine teachers who simply enjoy the role, and especially those who admire the young and want to be of service to help them in a way to make them flourish. They will be drawn to teaching work, and this is a blessing in the world you inhabit, because that is the requisite for advancement. 
it is the system you have, and although it is imperfect, surviving and meeting that challenge is very much a requisite for success in today's world. Anyone who helps the young survive this gauntlet will be conferring many blessings, and that in itself is divine, representing service to others for a high purpose. The deeper truth here is that because the system is flawed, all who serve it are to some degree serving the darkness. This is not realized by those involved with education. The institutions entrusted with education are revered and respected because they are the pillars of culture and attainment because almost all who are successful undergo the educational process created by society as a rite of passage as a credential for taking part in any area of responsibility. This has increasingly become a requirement. The fact it is a subversion of human initiative and creativity is the fault of those who corrupt your world. The deeper truth in this saying is that the service to a corrupt institution results in a lessening of the individual because they are serving the darkness and will be dragged down to some extent because there will be a karmic penalty exacted from them in the future. There is an inner knowing by those who endure the educational system and its regimentation that there is something faulty in its makeup. That is an intuitive awareness of a deeper truth, that what they are being asked to do makes little sense and seems illogical and even inhuman in many ways. Those feelings are suppressed in order to cope, and people override their instincts because the culture demands this. And people generally want to be cooperative and to fit in in order to be accepted and be successful. So they will squelch their own inner criticism simply to not be in conflict with themselves and resign themselves to serving that system and jumping through the hoops it raises and over the hurdles it places in the way of the learner to prove their worth and meet the quite arbitrary criteria for advancement. So the deep truth here in the somewhat mocking tone of this saying is a deep inner recognition that the emperor has no clothes and the emperor's minions, in this case the teachers of a flawed system, are serving a false god. We are not decrying the need for knowledge. We are simply pointing out that from the divine perspective, the system is rigged to minimize learning rather than encourage and offer opportunities for people to flourish where they will learn far more by doing than by sitting in classrooms year after year, going through pretend exercises and spooning facts into their brain they will little remember. It is only when they join the working world that their true education begins. There needs to be some priming of the pump with the cultural conventions, use of language, knowledge of arithmetic, and the workings of society. Beyond that, an apprentice system would do far more to create a world where people thrive and advancement is accelerated. People waste their best and most energetic years sitting on the sidelines, meeting the requirements of a procession of teachers serving the system of incrustation to convey what is largely flawed information, incomplete knowledge, and obsolete thinking. People learn by doing, and that is the deep inner meaning here of this saying, that the facts and information taught in formal education settings prove to be of little value in the real world for most individuals. The value is in engaging with life where the actions count. There is something real at stake and a real challenge to work on. What one does directly through one's own hands will be the best teacher by far than anything that can be learned listening to others. Well, that certainly sounds negative. <laughs> so I... I fully, I fully understand that, and I commiserate with the teachers out there and the yeah. many parents with children in school who are wondering what's going on all day, and they'll <laughs> ask their kid at the end of the day, well, what you learn today? Oh, nothing. You know, I went to school yeah, today. Oh, it's okay. That's a lot more critical, I think, than a lot of people would expect from Creator on this particular topic. You know, as much as we laud teachers, and frankly, you know, teachers probably deserve more than they're getting in a lot of cases, but at the yeah. same time, the system clearly is flawed. And it's interesting that Creator points out that there's going to be a karmic penalty for serving a flawed 
you know, system. So not just teaching, but that's true across the board. Anything that you serve that is doing harm at some level is going to come back to you. Well, if you want to know more about this, we did a radio show on education a while back, and it's filled with insights about why this is so. So I encourage people to check that out. Don't beat us up just yet. Yes. Go and learn a little <laughs> bit more about the divine perspective, and I think it might open your eyes, and it's worth considering because it's a, a pointer towards the problems that exist in the world in a larger sense than even education. Absolutely. You ask, Creator, what is the divine perspective of the saying, nothing is impossible for the man who doesn't have to do it himself? All right. Creator says, this saying relates to an aspect of human nature that talk is cheap. Another common saying that is a truism. These are interrelated. There are many who offer advice, but few volunteer to carry the load and bring about what is recommended or desired. This is what distinguishes the true leader from the person posing as an expert. It takes conviction, courage, insight, and capability to lead others on a successful mission to accomplish something of importance. No one is perfect at anything until they work at it. Growth and learning will be by the doing. Those who simply give advice are often those with only a basic outline of information about the matter at hand and lack direct experience. Experience is the best teacher, and it is the experienced hand who will tell you what you wish to do is perhaps far harder than you think and may well recommend caution or even deferring moving ahead until conditions are more favorable or more preparation has been done. There are many scenarios here where there are high stakes with much to lose by making a false step or choosing the wrong strategy. So it is imperative who you choose to follow, who would step forward with advice and recommend a course of action. It is often the one who will take on the responsibility who has confidence because they have hard-won knowledge through experience to begin with and would be the best and safest resource to put one's faith and trust in. Well, clearly, Creator would be a fan of the saying, lead by example. <laughs> yes, very much so. And I think this is a nice follow-on to what we were talking about, the difference between teachers and doers, so to speak, those out yes. in the real world getting firsthand experience with how to make things go, how to make things truly work, and not just theoretically or from a book learning or a a written account of someone else. And so it's secondhand, thirdhand, fifthhand by the time it gets to the student. Indeed. Let's take a let's let's change things up a little bit, Carl, and look at something maybe a bit more positive and uplifting as far as a, a common saying goes. What is the divine perspective of the saying, and this is by John Galsworthy, love has no age, no limit, and no death. All right, and this is Creator's words and answer. This is getting to the deep center of things quite beautifully because it reflects the fact that love is the purpose of existence and all that truly matters. If one serves love, one is living with high purpose and serving the soul in the doing. The depth and quality of love that is allowed to flourish will govern the happiness that is possible to achieve and the overall success of the journey. Much of life is devoted to the cultivation of love bonds with other human beings. This is purposeful because humans are designed that way and are part of a close-knit human family that is also close to the Creator. When there is a disconnect, people will suffer and will feel the loss and the absence of the love it represents and will yearn for its return. Any love that is denied in the giving or receipt will be a deficit and will be a negative energy that will return to the person in the future at some point wanting a repayment, a healing to happen, to put the love back that was denied or lost. Similarly, the love that is shared in the bonds of marriage, the bonding of parents with their children, creates a love connection that will exist forever. It is the norm, not the exception, 
that people end up married to individuals who they have known from other lifetimes and cherish as friends and loves, often through many differing roles as lover, spouse, parent, or child, and experiencing them by turns with others in a soul group who travel together through time and share many experiences, good and bad, to take on challenges for learning and growth and help one another along the way as friends, neighbors, co-workers, as well as family members. Love is deep because love is eternal. Well, that's a profound message, of course, and one that people are are trying to, uh, I think, believe wholeheartedly with their whole heart, mind, and soul, because love is the one thing that is missing more than any other down here. I mean, we are we are loving creatures. We come from a loving creator, and yet we're being challenged. We're being tested down here uh, to see, I guess, how we do without love being constantly present. Well, and in so much of human endeavor, human pursuit, the workaday world, and the human interactions that take place, love tends to be last on the list. <laughs> you know, it's more about <laughs> having uh, a say in things and having control and having some personal power to have prestige or a a status in the pecking order and those kinds of considerations. You know, am I dressed well enough? Am I going to look good? Am I going to maybe be a little more sharp looking than the ladies I go out to lunch with? And and that, that kind of, you know, superficial materialist view of things and not the deeper realities of human origin and existence and the importance of love and everything. And it's it's really fascinating to talk with creator about the working of the world and the karmic forces that bring things back around to us over and over. And you know, people look at their families and they might say, well, my God, I never would have chosen to be with this group of, of, of people. They've given me nothing but grief the whole time. Well, we don't realize it, but we chose it. We yes. chose who we come down to be with. Yes. And it's often to fix things that may have happened in another life. And the challenge, the, is, yeah, the, the challenge is you're back with the knuckleheads again, you know, right. to serve right. them. We do this to serve one another, even putting ourselves at risk of being abused. But that gives the people a chance to maybe do better this time. It doesn't always work out that way. Right. And then there's more karmic damage and wounding, and you got to come back in another go-round. But eventually, if you heal your stuff, you will graduate from that troubled family, and you'll get to be with another member or group of your soul beings you know, and have a better life. And someone else who's deeply troubled, hasn't grown enough to heal their trouble, will be in that prior family that you graduated from. And this is how it works. Yeah. We grow and become enlightened over a series of lifetimes. And not doing it in one lifetime. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of work to get out from under deep damage that's caused by others around us. Well, and that's why of- love is so important. I think the, the I think the the reality of love is that love is the connection that binds us all, and that truly is eternal. That's unchanging. What what happens is is that it gets covered up. You know, the the dust builds up on top of it, and it's up to us to have to clear those uh, that that obstacle away so that we can see and partake the love more clearly. That's actually there. So it's I. It's perhaps it's, it's in a way we're not actually seeking more love, but we're seeking more wisdom that prevents love from being obscured. Hmm. Hmm. Well, but see, the imparting of wisdom, looking at someone with fairness and equanimity—that's an exhibition of wisdom. But it's a loving act. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Because you're treating the other person as an equal. You're treating them as being worthy. You're extending a loving outreach to them just by being civil, by being kind, 
by being open and accepting of their presence and giving them your time and your energy. All of that is a love-based interaction. So we, we underestimate the extent to which love plays a role in things. And largely it's absence. And that's that's the part we struggle with and that gives us trouble. Yes. And all those little acts of inconsiderateness and the slights and the uh, depredations that we inflict on one another, sometimes with humor, but it's it, it can be cutting and damaging. Those are all an interplay of the force of love waxing and waning, growing and shrinking, and sometimes being in and out of the room entirely. So it's up to us to learn how to get back to that and be more forgiving and more accepting of ourselves too. And, and that's well, a, a lot part of, of it. There's a lot of um, clearing of the windshield that we have to do. If you've ever driven down the road, of course, in a heavy rain, which all of us have, those wipers are going back and forth awfully fast to keep that windshield clear. And in this wind, in this life that we're living here on Earth, there's a lot of rain falling on all of us. So we, we really got to keep those wipers going at high speed in order to see clearly the love that's actually there. Well, that's the, that's the plight of the world in a nutshell. There's been so big a pileup of unhealed wounding and losses from love being absent. And we have to work our way through it to graduate from this mess. Indeed. Um, the, I think the problem of evil is, is also uh, a seeking of love, but it's love of the self. You know, they're, they're looking to feel empowered, looking to feel strong, they're looking to feel valuable, which is all the things that love really is. You know, but it, they're not able to achieve it and they're focusing only on self. So ultimately, everybody's chasing love at some point, even those that are as far away from it as we can possibly imagine. Yes, yes. But this is the problem of the ones who are really lost, because without the ability to give love, they're going to be at a disadvantage and they're going to harm yeah, everyone yeah. around them. And there's a lot of that taking place. Indeed. Well, check out our prayer book, uh, getwisdom.com slash prayer, which uh, enables you to learn how to pray truly effectively, more so than most people can, can realize and have experience with. Uh, also, check out uh, Creator's Wisdom, uh, getwisdom.com slash uh, creator, and you can get Creator Speaks, which uh, is a, a number of divine truths that are encapsulated in our, our downloadable ebook. And uh, we'll be back to discuss more about common sayings right after this. Back to the last, that was the last segment of Get Wisdom. We're talking about common sayings that uh, people find to contain wisdom. Uh, we're get, checking with creators to see how much wisdom they actually contain. And in this last segment, we're going to deal with adversity and embracing the true purposes of life. So, Carl, you asked creator, what is the divine perspective of the saying, no good deed goes unpunished? Yeah, that's a nice, juicy one. I've used that one a lot myself <laughs> as a do-gooder. You're not the only one. <laughs> All right. Now, this is what Creator says about this. These are Creator's words channeled. This is a recognition through hard-won life experience that things often will backfire and will not go as planned. That even setting about to do good will many times fall short or be thwarted in some way and might even backfire to cause harm to the would-be benefactor doing an act of loving kindness, presumably to help someone or alleviate suffering in some fashion by solving a problem in society or a personal situation where someone cannot take care of things by themselves and needs a benefactor to participate, look out for them, or continue or contribute resources that are lacking. There is a corollary in the saying, there is a law of unintended consequences to cover this phenomenon, that the good intentions often produce an undesirable result, a mixed blessing, or even creating the opposite of what was intended to be a benefit. The reason this is so is that so many human activities become corrupted and are thwarted by a direct intervention that will be unseen in its mechanism, but is nonetheless orchestrated to happen by dark spirits and or the extraterrestrial alliance, 
who are the puppet masters behind the scenes working through their human minions to limit human progress and cause problems again and again in every sphere of human activity. We understand this is quite a dark view to present and may even be seen as a worse state of being than simply that things are somehow destined to go wrong. This saying may only be seen by some as bad luck or even a 50-50 proposition where sometimes it'll work out and sometimes not. And this is simply something to do with the law of averages because of human imperfection and so on. It is difficult to think of the world being corrupted and loaded against you to have a dark outcome more often than not. But this is the case. It is better to know truth than to live a lie, especially when you can change things for the better by waking up to the truth we are sharing with you and requesting the help of the divine realm to deliver you from the workings of the darkness that has crept into your world and now holds you in its grip. I think this is one of the more revealing uh, truths, so to speak, that's been shared because people recognize that this happens. You know, almost everybody's had an experience where they've gone out of their way, they've gone the extra mile, and they get a blowback for it, you know, and it's really, it really is undeserved, you know, in in most cases. And it happens a lot, more so than you would think would happen in the normal course of things. So I think this is a clue that there's something bigger going on behind the scenes. This is an opportunity for people to kind of sit back and look at it and maybe glean some of that themselves. Well, you know, it sounds like a wild-eyed fantasy, a conspiracy theory, evidence of mental uh, disturbance in yours truly. I understand that completely, but I know a lot about this, and I know how it's being done, how widespread it is, how diabolical it is, and it is mind-blowing. And that's the reason it's so pervasive, because it's so widespread and so much a part of things on every level of human activity. And God has to stand aside and watch this because people don't know what's happening and can't take action. And it's up to us. We're running our world, not the divine, but we can have the divine come in at our request and only via our request. People need to pray more. People need to ask for everyone to be raised up, especially the perpetrators. That's the mission of Get Wisdom in a nutshell. Yes, we're we're facing uh, opposition that is beyond what we're going to be able to remove on our own. We need divine assistance to make that happen. Mm -hmm. You ask, Creator, what is the divine perspective of the saying, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing? That was a saying by Edmund Burke. Well, it's very apropos of what we've been discussing. Yes. <laughs> and Creator says this is a divine call to action that has been generated from the depths of the direst human circumstances and is a stirring reminder there is a need for vigilance, insight, and a clarity of thought and perception to not accept things at face value, but to be cautious, to look deeper and question everything. Because most things done by humans are done in service to corrupt intentions and faulty institutions and their requirements, rules, and regulations, all of which cheapen the life experience and may be working against you to even shorten your lifespan. You are in a world under threat for its existence. There is an imperative here to act. Complacency is your enemy, for it is the tool of the darkness that works against you the most. The threat is hidden and acting covertly, lurking behind the scenes and in the guise of many prosaic life circumstances that seem unavoidable and unintentional and simply part of nature, when this could not be farther from the truth, that you are living in a world designed to be a loving nest. Anything that is acting against your interests is more than likely due to a deliberate orchestration through extraterrestrial technologies that work to worsen things in a way that will be unseen but devastating. It is time to awaken and then to awaken others, to learn about the threats facing you and take action to defend yourselves and work for a better world through a divine partnership. That is essential to your future survival. 
There can be no greater threat than to be living with an evil cabal of dark spirits and extraterrestrial collaborators wanting your demise. That is the current reality. The strategy is a slow tightening of the noose. The signs are all around you. We hope you heed our warning. It is heartfelt and given with love. For this is what loving beings do. They will sound a warning when it is appropriate and sorely needed. In today's world, complacency will seal your fate. I think if we were to assign a word, a single word for the day, it is complacency. Uh, You know, I had a friend once who liked the saying, oh, you're good. You're good. All right. Good for nothing. In other words, it's, you know, you may be a good person. You may be, you know, not critical in living your life and you're not stepping on anybody and you're avoiding stepping on ants even as you walk down the street. But we're in a dire situation here and we need more than just some people being good. You know, people need to actually take action and reach out and do proactive things to uh, to save this world. That That's what's at stake here. Complacency is the problem the creator is harping on. The creator is not harping on evil per se. He's not even harping on being mean to other people and all that. Complacency is the one that sitting back and just not acting, that is the biggest problem right now. Yes. And that's why we're coming forward and sharing some of these dark perspectives with you. And it's because the world is dark. You know, wake up, look around. There needs to be answers. There needs to be solutions. There needs to be implementation of the solutions. That's where you come in. You personally, you're the only one who can make the difference. The government isn't going to do this. The police and the military aren't going to do this. It has to be the ordinary person who still is awake enough to hear the voice of God in things and decide, all right, I'll go for it. I will make a heartfelt request to the Almighty to come in and raise everything up. That's all we're asking here. And it can make the difference. And without it, we may go under. (laughs) Yes, we may go under. You ask creator, what is the divine perspective of the saying? The best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt with the heart. And that was a saying by Helen Keller. And for anyone who doesn't know, Helen Keller was someone who was born blind and deaf and was finally rescued from being completely disconnected from even her family in any meaningful way by a a gifted teacher who made a connection to her and helped her find a way to learn language and doing signing and so forth. So the most, the best and most beautiful things in the world cannot be seen or even touched. They must be felt with the heart, is the saying. And this is what Creator says about it. This is a most beautiful saying that is divine truth and gifted by one who suffered greatly through personal deprivation and a troubled life, but speaks to the reality of the divine as the source of love. That is the most powerful force in the universe and the thing of greatest value. It is a reward and a blessing to both give and receive. The gifting of love through acts of loving kindness raises up the giver, even as it raises up the recipient. What could be more beautiful or more rewarding or more worthwhile as a focus of one's life than to be part of something so very magnificent? That is why the richest among you are the ones who live through loving kindness in all they do. It transcends the physical trappings of human culture and the accoutrements of status and accomplishment prized so greatly by many, but represent things and not feelings that become highly treasured because they are the most rewarding. The value of love is priceless, for without it, life will not be complete and no amount of money will make it so. Love is felt by and conveyed by the heart, not the head. The more one opens the heart and is in tune with love and as love is a goal, the more one will be in divine alignment and will be rewarded with joy and happiness all along the way. This means that love is the greatest of goals because it is the greatest accomplishment to be a giver and receiver of love both in all one does. It is a difficult and lofty goal to be sure. 
but it brings the greatest of riches there are in the doing because the giving and receiving of love are the height of human experience. Love is your origin, love is your purpose, and love is your destiny. It will only get better in the future. Transcending the human experience and the physical existence you suffer as much as enjoy at present will bring you into the big leagues of love that are amplified tremendously in the experiencing compared to your earthly existence and what you can experience and feel. We say this to raise you up, not to make you feel lesser in some way or deprived, but rather as an incentive to keep going. If you make love the objective of your existence, you will be walking in the path of the saints. You will be exalted. You will be raising yourself up and walking in partnership with the divine. You will be on our wavelength. And that is the best and most glorious experience a human can have. Indeed. You know, use it or lose it. Love is meant to be shared. And uh, we really need to get that message out there. But you need to act. You, the, the complacency is a big problem. Uh, learn about the Lightworker Healing Protocol. It's the, probably the, the single best tool available to really get at the deeper healing needs that humanity needs in order to progress and move forward to that raising up that Creator just got done talking about. Yes, yes. You can help heal the world. You personally. Anyone can do this. It's a series of high-level informed prayer requests. And I would challenge anyone who thinks we're just here serving the darkness. We're dark. We have a dark message. We talk about dark stuff all the time. Listen to that last few minutes and tell me that's not a loving being coming through, informing us about truth. Absolutely. Check out the Lightboard Healing Protocol at getwisdom.com slash LHP. And we'll be back next week with some more Get Wisdom. Thanks for everything, Carl. Be well. <laughs> 